Call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Redefiners. I'm Hoda Tahoon, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates, and I'm here once again with my amazing podcast partner and co-host, Clark Murphy. Hey, Hoda. Good to see you again. It's good to get the band back. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to our listeners that you can find all of our episodes for Redefiners and the Leadership Lounge on YouTube. And if you're currently watching Redefiners on YouTube, just hit that subscribe button below so you don't miss an episode. Clark, We talk a lot about technology and transformation on this podcast, and one of the industries that I think has undergone a massive transformation over the years is the automotive space. It has, amazingly. I mean, the auto industry has transformed so many times, initially around government regulation, and then the change in consumer said, what's my experience in mobility? Then you have climate change and sustainability. So I think the manufacturing, the consumer evolution on the auto industry has been fascinating. It is. And also think about all of the electronic and electric vehicles that have popped up onto the scene, obviously with Tesla, Rivian, and all of these others around the world and the manufacturing completely changing in China. Everyone's really pushing the limit and pushing new bounds and continuing to innovate, as you said, about the customer and how to anticipate what the transport of the future is going to be like. Hoda, you're, you go to auto shows. Nobody knows uh, unless you watch. Hoda is actually a a car girl living in South Florida. I always find myself torn between loving a lot of the innovation, but also really loving some of those older, classically beautiful cars, like vintage. I'm talking like 60s and 70s, where driving was not just for leisure. It was a bit of a sport. Well, I was a vintage car guy even in high school. I drove a 67 Mustang, which was the, you know, the iconic, iconic car. So I wish I still had it. I got to tell you. So Clark, Tell our listeners who our guest is today. Our guest is Jim Rowan, the president and CEO of Volvo. Uh, Jim joined Volvo in 2022 after serving as CEO of Ember Technologies. He was CEO at Dyson, talk about cool design, and also was at COO of BlackBerry in some of the defining years of BlackBerry, and has served as a non-executive director at KKR. He's currently a member of the shareholder committee at Henkel uh, Age. Jim, welcome to Redefiners. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. You have a fascinating background. You didn't start your career in the automotive industry. In fact, you started your career as a mechanical engineer and worked your way into several leadership roles in the consumer tech sector, working at Dyson, BlackBerry, and other companies. Talk to us about your leadership journey and how did you get to your current CEO role? I actually started as as an apprentice. Back in the day, and this is one of the great things that I think at the time we still in Britain at that point in time, we, we still had a very strong vocational path for, for people coming into the workplace. And I took that vocational path and actually did a, a mechanical engineering apprenticeship. And then from there was lucky enough, I had some fantastic bosses and some great mentors. And that took me then into the academic world to get qualifications and then eventually became manufacturing engineer through time, but that was the origins. And it was at the time I look back on it now, but at the time it was such a great schooling and such a great platform to learn from the shop floor to see how things are actually put together with tradesmen, with with turners and and fitters and machine workers and so on. And there was was such great learnings and all of that, not just from a on the job perspective, but actually just dealing with people. And I think that was, that was a large foundation upon which that kind of helped me build. And then from there, again, I had a, a lot of great uh, support from different bosses as I joined those different companies. I find it really interesting. You end up with really iconic consumer design companies, Dyson, BlackBerry. What's the path? What's the flip to being so hands-on and, and an engineer by training to then leading design companies really, or consumer design that catches your eye and captures market share through great design? Well, I went from doing a mechanical engineering apprenticeship to a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. And at the time, DEC were one of the biggest computer companies in the world. I think probably second only to the likes of IBM. And this is back in the the late eighties. Surface mount technology was really just beginning at that point in time. And that kind of allowed me then to learn a brand new outlook on where technology was headed. Uh, from there, 
I left Digital Equipment Corporation and I set up my own business at the age of about 24. That was a defining moment because I could then take those learnings and apply that to, to my own business. I did that in conjunction with uh, a colleague of mine actually at Digital and we were two young, very young guys who set up our, our business as I guess at that point in time we would have been termed entrepreneurs nowadays. Goodness knows what we were termed then. But <laughs> but it worked it worked out tremendously well for, for both of us. Um and that really then allowed us both the confidence to take on bigger positions because when you run your own company you really find out a lot about yourself, of course, and you find out a lot about business. If you don't bring in enough business, you don't pay yourself. You learn bookkeeping, you learn accountancy, you learn people management, you learn employment law. Not really by choice, if I'm being honest, <laughs> but, but by necessity. And then you can port all of that forward. So I then eventually we sold the business and I became part of a much bigger multinational company called Flextronics at the time. And that's really then where my executive career kind of took off. Tell us a little bit about <clears throat> getting to BlackBerry. I mean, Flextronics is kind of, again, another iconic company. You're really ticking off the iconic companies here. But BlackBerry, through a tremendous amount of growth, adopting to new markets, adopting to what was going on with handheld devices, what was it like to be there then? And then obviously be COO during this incredible period of competition as well. Well, Flex was a great perch because at Flex, at Flextronics, you saw, I mean, we were a manufacturer for some of the world's biggest brands. And it's one of these huge companies. I think we it was $25 billion in revenue. We had over 100 factories. We had close to 200,000 people. So a huge company. And really, its raison d'etre was to build products very efficiently and very effectively for some of the world's biggest electronic manufacturers. And what you saw from that vantage point was how really good tech companies build the supply chains, build the manufacturing, design the products and bring those products to market. And you could cherry pick, or it allowed me to cherry pick the best of the best. And some of the biggest companies that we did work for weren't necessarily the best at doing certain things. But between all of those different companies that we were involved with, you, you could really get a sense of who was leading in certain disciplines. And then, of course, when I joined BlackBerry, we could bring some of those learnings, if you will, to BlackBerry. And yeah, I was lucky. I was at BlackBerry for those formative years when it was still really growing like a train through the course of that. This is pre, of course, pre-2007 when where, before Apple and iPhone came into the industry. And there's many parallels right now that, that I think has helped me in the role at, at Volvo. If you look at the smartphone industry and how it went from a feature phone where you had people like Nokia, uh, Motorola, Sony Ericsson, HTC, they were really good at m mechanical engineering and, and, uh, and manufacturing, let's say. Not so good at software. And even at BlackBerry, masters of RF technology, radio frequency technology, uh, master of power management. But when it came to software, we're obviously behind uh, companies like Apple. And But if you look at what happened in that industry, is that it went through this massive transformation in a very short period of time, two, two and a half years. The most interesting thing about that industry transformation, at least from my side, is that the people who started, the Blackberries, the Motorola's, the Sony Ericsson's, the, the, the Nokia's, they weren't the ones that won the day. It was basically two platforms. It was iOS and Android, which have since both become trillion dollar companies as a direct result of seeing what was happening in that industry at that point in time and how the power of mobile technology could be used 10 years into the future uh, and how that was going to be powered basically by software and by creating a platform. And that's what's happening in the auto industry right now. It's not about electrification. We term it this big massive change about electrification. That's really the tip of the iceberg. Yes, electrification is important, of course, but we understand battery technology. We understand e-motors and inverters. We can harness those technologies pretty effectively already. The biggest change, the most profound change that's happening and will continue to happen in our industry is software, high computational silicon, connectivity, and data. And if you don't understand those at a visceral level today and you're in the automotive industry, you're already in trouble. And that really, the parallels between how quickly the feature phone industry moved to smartphone 
And how quickly now you're seeing the automotive industry move from internal combustion to, to next generation mobility. That's really the most exciting place to be in the world right now because all of that's going on at the same time. Hold on. So you're saying everything we hear about electrification and EV, that's not going to drive how the consumer chooses to buy a car. Can you keep going with that about connectivity and data? Well, if you look at electrical propulsion, if you take a really well-tuned internal combustion engine, new engine, well-tuned, it runs at roughly 35% efficiency. You lose efficiency to noise, to heat, to vibration, so on. When you take our latest E motors or our, our latest electrical propulsion, it runs between 90 and 95% efficiency. Wow. Now, you don't need to be a data scientist to figure out that's a pretty big uh, difference. And so there's no doubt, and of course, there's zero tailpipe emissions. I'd love to pull a little bit on the infrastructure piece, because obviously that's a an ongoing investment that will continue with other players outside of Volvo and other automotive companies, because there's the impact at the community level, at the broader infrastructure level. Tell us a little bit about how you're going about making those investments and educating at the infrastructure level. Yes, I think the investments in infrastructure come in two ways. One is we need to make sure there's enough energy in the grid, first of all, so there's a grid investment. We'd like that energy as much as possible, of course, to be green energy. So how the energy that is actually getting fed into the grid, can that come from renewables? In my personal opinion, I think nuclear has got to come back on the table uh, in, in, in its next form. We know that the new technologies around uh, uh, nuclear is so much safer, so much more efficient than in the past. And so rather looking backwards at disasters such as Chernobyl or Fukushima, we need to look forward to the new technologies uh, that can drive that forward. So let's assume that we can get enough green energy or non-fossil fuel energy into the grids to start with. And um, then it's about the infrastructure itself. We need, I think that the, the changes in terms of battery density, charging speed and the cost of batteries, that's on us. That's on us, the manufacturers. We need to figure that out. But I think infrastructure, that's where government can play a role. Uh, and that's where I applaud things like the Inflation Reduction Act and the USA, which is driving investment into green technologies, which I think is to the betterment of society. And so we need some help. We'd like to see some help in that. I don't ask for subsidies on our cars. I think that's up to us, the car manufacturers, the auto manufacturers, to make sure that we can build, design and sell cars at a, pr a profit under our own steam, so to speak. So subsidies to buy EVs, I don't think that's really, I think governments have got other things to spend their money on, but I do think they can help in putting in the infrastructure. What's it like coming into such a traditional industry? And you're not a car guy, you're a transformation guy. What's it, what was it like to enter into it? You've just done a deal with a groundbreaking company, Tesla. How has the transition been for you to create change in a traditional industry? Yeah, I was asked that question when I first took on the role. How does it feel like you're, you're not an automotive guy? And you, do you feel that you're at a disadvantage with some of your peers in the automotive industry? And quite honestly, I was like, listen, we have 45,000 people in our company. 44,900 are from the auto industry. I think we've got that covered. We need to start bringing in skills from elsewhere, from where the industry's headed, which is software and silicon and connectivity and data and, and some of the, and even energy and energy management and power electronics. All of those things have been used in the, the tech industry or in the consumer industry, which is where I come from, for many years. We were just talking earlier about how Apple really understood the power of software and how that could be connected to mobile technology to create a whole ecosystem that's added tremendous value for their investors. And I think the same thing's happening here. Since I've joined, we've continued to invest in skills from outside the auto industry, mainly on the software and the silicon side and the connectivity side as well, <clears throat> and even in data science, of course, and computer science. So all of that now has given us a much more blended skill base that allows us to be relevant, not just for today, but well into the future. On the data science side, and obviously from a, a broader technology standpoint and where the world is moving with AI, et cetera, and you talked quite a bit about the data piece, how are you harnessing that and where technology and AI is going into decision-making for you from where you stand with Volvo, but also more broadly about the industry? Yes, a super question. And I mean, really, it's about being able to take that data and the EX90, which we've just, the, our latest car. So in that car, we have 16 ultrasonic sensors. We have eight, eight megapixel cameras. We have five radar systems and a LIDAR system. 
LiDAR, if you're familiar with that technology. So LiDAR is a laser ba- a laser based technology that, that allows the car to see 200, 250 meters in pitch blackness or in blinded sun or in blinded sunlight. Wow. And and of course at Volvo we're very concerned and focused on safety. Mm-hmm. So this technology allows our customers, our car and ultimately our customers to be able to see dangers ahead at, at night time. Unfortunately, a lot of fatal and, and, and very bad accidents happen at night time. Why? There's less visibility, people are tired, the road's quieter, so people don't expect to come across a, a, a cow or a deer or, or an obstacle on the road. And when you're traveling at 100, 120 kilometers an hour, uh, and you're only traveling by the, the light of your headlamps at that, you just don't physically have enough time to react. Whereas with LiDAR, that gives the car sees at nine seconds before you'll see it and it will warn the driver. This is not autonomous driving, this is still assisted driving. If you're traveling at 120 kilometers an hour and it's a, maybe a wet surface, you need a long, quite a long stopping distance. Yeah. So that's just an example of how technology and all of that technology can be used. And the only way that can be harnessed is if you have core compute technology and high computational silicon as part of the architecture of the car. Uh, and those things work together. And one thing we wanted to do is invest in the software that allowed us Volvo engineers to control that software and understand every single line of code. Within our company, we have 900 people that just write the code between the silicon and what we call the application layer, the safety set, which is the sensors and the camera and the LiDAR and so on. And that way we understand all the sensor fusion software, we understand all the perception stack software, and that's some of the skills that we're building because that's going to be used time and time again. And of course, as high computational silicon increases, if we follow the Moore's law principle, and we can see that already, as sensors increase, as, as cameras become better, as LiDAR becomes even better, as long as you understand the software stack, you can continue to put those improvements. So Jim, I, I, I have always thought of Volvo as the safe car, the safe brand, which you've just talked about a little bit about using data for safety. But if we go back to design, Dyson, phones, How do you, as the chief executive, how do you look at the vision and the reality of the safety and the look and the feel and the hip and the cool? How do you balance this out as a leader? Well, first of all, you really, you need to have design working hand in glove with engineering. And in every company that I've been in, that I think has been successful in the hardware space, that design, hardware, software, obviously everything coming together. That's what the great, that's where we're great products are born. The the funny thing about innovation, the funny thing about creativity is that it kind of looks like it's a linear line. You go from idea to product and it's a straight line and it takes a year or seven months or whatever it takes. The great thing about, or the, the, the strange thing about creativity and innovation is that it's messy. It is extremely messy. And inside the start and finish, there's a lot of conversations, there's a lot of angst, there's a lot of failure, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of debate. Sometimes that ro- debate is rather robust. In a funny way, the more messy that is, the better the outcome of the product at the end of the day. And so I think back to your question, it's how do you get those teams, how do you get the design teams, the engineering teams, the product teams, the marketing teams, uh, the production teams, uh, and also the, the, the customer focus part of that the, the outside in, what does the customer really care about? Blend all that together. Um, and, and I think you need a structure that does that. You need somebody who says, I'm the, I'm the product owner. I'm going to own this product. And ultimately, I'm going to make the decisions that, that, that I think are right for the company and right for the customer. But you also need a collaborative spirit to get that done. And whether that's been luck or happenstance, those companies that I've worked for that have done that, especially those product companies like BlackBerry and Dyson and, and Volvo, that, that's what they do incredibly well. And I'm sure other companies like Apple and, and so on, I'm sure they do exactly the same. Jim, let's shift the conversation a little bit to talk about transformation specifically in the industry and more broadly, because you've set a very ambitious goal for Volvo cars to be 50% fully electric by 2025. That's around the corner and 100% fully electric by 2030. Beyond that, your goal is to be a climate neutral company, I, th- I believe, by 2040. Tell us about that and how's the transition going so far? Yeah, I mean, you, you make these long 
you make these long strategic decisions and you set those goals. As I said earlier, it's, it's clear for me that electrical propulsion has got huge benef benefits over internal combustion, but it's going to take time. Internal combustion as well. One, one thing which we don't talk enough about is that internal combustion engines need a lot of servicing. Right, there's there's oil changes, there's gaskets, there's cell, you know, the cylinder heads that can blow, there's piston rings, and these, and 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 that's costly for customers. With um, electrical propulsion, the the overall total cost of ownership for the customer is much less. So I think electrical propulsion is a technology which will become much much more adopted over time, but it will take time to get there. We are in a really fortunate position that we have really good mild mild hybrid technology products. We have really good plug-in electric hybrid products and we have full EVs. And what I see even in the USA is the, the West Coast is moving very fast now to, to EV, of course, helped by, by um, the infrastructure and some of the, the big companies that are, that are very popular there. The interior is taking longer. Same in Europe. Southern Europe is taking longer than Northern Europe. Same in China. The provinces are, are taking longer to move to, to full EV than the, than, the, than the big cities. And it's driven by those, those same things. The cost of batteries, the speed of charging, the infrastructure itself and, and range. And then, of course, we saw some of the tariffs that are coming in recently. So you're dealing with some of the geopolitical fallout on that. At the end of the day, it's hard to be exactly precise when you're going to be 100% electric or when you're going to, but the direction of travel is the right direction of travel. And we're investing in the technologies of the future. Um, the nice thing about it is when we invest in, in battery or inverter technology for EVs, we also get that benefit for a plug-in electric hybrids because they use a lot of battery technology as well. So that technology ports forward towards full EV adoption. It also ports backwards towards our existing plug-in electric hybrid technology. We come back to your leadership style. We come back to this rooting as an engineer, a rooting on the factory floor, or the rooting of your experience in hands-on. And now some of the phrases about LIDAR and laser technology have far surpassed my experiences. What's your advice to someone coming out the route to be a modern leader, to harness data and design and teams and collaborative spirit? You have this incredible experience. What's helped to find you as a leader, an entrepreneur now running a huge company, and what's your advice to leaders? How, what experiences should they have in this world today to be a great leader tomorrow? My father was a huge influence because he was a believer that education was the answer to pretty much everything. And that we were so privileged in being brought up in the UK where we had access to, at that time it was free, uh, education all the way up through university, but still very affordable education. And there's roots, I think, still today. I'd like to see those enhanced more, of course, around the world. But it starts with that. It starts with that thirst and that. And I, I think what that bred was curiosity. For me, curiosity is really, it's really the accelerator towards learning. Um, and how do you keep the curiosity in young people? to want to be curious about things and how do we teach them in a way that keeps them engaged and, and inspires them. And then I had some fantastic mentors. I was just lucky. I had some really fantastic people who, were, who saw the potential in me long before I saw it in myself, who built that confidence and gave me opportunities and nurtured that. And nobody does it on their own. I mean, anybody who thinks they do, you know, you know hasn't been looking, hasn't been paying attention because somebody somewhere has been helping them. And I get asked the question a lot, especially from young people, how do I get promoted? How do I advance my career within the organization? Not, not necessarily Volvo, but pretty much anywhere. And I was asked the question so often that I actually sat down and thought about it. And I came up with what I say is the eight C's of progress. And it was pretty simple. One was commitment. It's basically hard work. There's just, the job's not done till it's done. And much as we'd like to find shortcuts, there's just no substitution for rolling your sleeves up, getting your fingernails dirty and just getting it done. And I think sometimes, especially with young people, they, they, they don't realize how much value we see as, as maybe their managers or their leaders to see just people just getting stuck in and getting stuff done and, and not shirking the responsibility. Then it's about collaboration. And I say this to young people, it's not about you. It's about the team. 
Uh, and 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 that class and people like working with people they like working with. It's as it's as simple as that. Communication for me was all about learning to listen, not learning to talk. Most people I learned they learn to do presentations and they're up there and they're they're very swanky and they've got the nice suit on and they've got a great presentation and and the biggest part about communication is is that listening piece. And then there's compassion, a much underrated skill and 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 my and compassion for me is empathy put into action. That's all compassion is. First of all, you need to be empathetic, but then you need to actually go do something about it. And then we've got continuous learning. I was a, a great, I was in a great position where I had a boss who told me you should move your career in this direction. By the way, it's a sideways move. You don't get any extra money. You don't get a title, but it's going to round you out. And I was skeptical. I've got to say, when I was a manufacturing engineer, this was at Flextronics, uh, a gentleman called Mike McNamara, fantastic, one of the best people who I've ever worked with. And he was my boss and he said, you need to go learn supply chain because manufacturing is only a small part of it. And it was one of the best pieces of advice that I had. And it was just, it was about continuous learning. It was none to do with money or, or title. And then we've got courage. It takes a lot, especially for young people to speak truth to power, to be able to stand up, be unpopular and to be comfortable being uncomfortable at a young age. That's difficult, but it's a skill and it's, and it, it's akin to integrity to some extent, but courage is a big part of, I think, which drives people on. Consistency, you don't say one thing to one person and something to somebody else. Again, that just breeds trust in, in, in my opinion. And then the last part is confidence. How can we be confident in someone who's not confident in themselves? And I see all these wonderful young people who are well-educated, who, who should go set the world on fire, and they just lack a little bit of confidence. And when they build that, when you see, well, if you can help them build that, and you see then what they're capable of, I was watching a, I was watching a, a tennis event, and there was a young lady who I think she was like eighteen. She just lost. She played well. She would lost her her match, and like literally thirty seconds after she lost, there's a microphone in her face. Mm -hmm. What do you think about losing? And this young woman was fantastic. Eighteen years old, obviously exhausted physically, mentally. There's a massive crowd. She knows she's in front of the TV crew and how she handled herself. She, she paid respect to her opponent. She paid respect to the crowd. And I was thinking, don't ever underestimate what young people can do if you just give them a chance. And so that's, I'm on a bit of a crusade. When people talk about diversity, then of course we should have gender and race, color, religion and stuff. But one thing I think we miss is we don't have enough age diversity at the decision making table. It's, and especially now where these are digital natives. They understand the digital world much better than I'm an analog. I was born in the analog age, so I can translate to digital, but it takes a little bit of time. The, the digital natives just think differently. And we need to get tho those voices around the decision-making table. And we need to get them in younger while they've still got the energy and the, the passion and the creativity. Anyways, that's a side note, but that's what I'm on now. That's my crusade for the next while. I love that crusade. What do you say to the critics of they don't have enough experience? What do they know? We have a lot of digital expertise. What do you say to those naysayers? I say, go look at companies like Facebook when Zuckerberg was 19 and, and what he's built as a company. Go look at guys like Bill Gates when he did Microsoft. Go look at companies like Steve Jobs and Apple and uh, Steve Wozniak. There's so many of those stories. And then just look at sport. Just look at people in sport and how well they are trained, how well they can perform. I think as long as they've got, yes, do they need some help and support as we all do? Do they need some nurturing, some guidance? Absolutely. And I think you saw that at Google. I think that was a way in which Google harnessed the, uh, the energy and the creativity and, and the intelligence of the founders of Google by bringing in, obviously, Eric Smith at the time. So it, you can absolutely make that happen, but you've got to path a way that can be done. Okay, trivia for the day, which some listeners will know. The rowan tree in Scotland is planted next to the house to protect the house and bring it good fortune. Jim, any reflections on the rowan tree? But more importantly, how much is luck and how much do you count on good fortune as, as a leader, making your way through the world. Yes, uh, so the rowan tree is known as, the, I think it's known as the crown of the highlands. So the berries on the rowan tree grow at the top so that the, and it's red berries in the, in the winter and it grows through the winter. And that's the thing that feeds the robins 
that's one of the because it's the the fruit's poisonous to humans, so they don't eat it and snaffle it all up as we do everything else. <laughs> but but it's left for the birds because it's not poisonous to them. Listen, I think to be born in certain countries where you have access to healthcare and education and, and opportunity, that's the first stroke of luck. It mm. has absolutely nothing to do with <laughs> with anything other than where you were born. And then secondly, to be and companies where you can have access to great mentors and, and people who who will give you the opportunity. Access to free education, I think, or, or at least affordable education is massive. And again, a lot of that is luck. And then it's those who make the best of that luck. So it's the combination, just decisions that you make that you don't realize how much forward they're going to pay. But then there's a part of harnessing that and making the best of that. And I come back to that number one, which is just, just commitment. If you really want something, you only get out of something what you put into it. And there's no substitute for hard work. Warren Buffett said, he says, you want people who have got energy, trust and intelligence. And if they don't have intelligence and integrity, then you want them lazy. <laughs> <laughs> or, or something to that effect. But it, it was a, a typical uh, Warren Buffett statement. So I would hire and I have hired, I will hire people with energy and passion way above looking for somebody who has a first class honours degree. I will hire somebody who's put themselves through college by waiting tables at a second tier university, much more than I will hire somebody and just because they went to a top tier university, that, that because of the fortune of their parents being rich enough to send them there. So we end uh, each podcast with a set of rapid fire questions where we're going to Ask you a quick question, immediate answer, we'll move on to the next one. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. What was your first car? An Austin Maxi 1750. Oh my gosh. Okay. I bought it at an auction. It was a mess. I didn't have a lot of money, so it was the best I could do at the time. But I was an apprentice, so I, I, could, I could fix it up. So there you go. So we talked a lot about technology and smartphones today. Jim, what are your top five phone applications that you cannot live without? I often say, if you show me your home screen, I'll show you your lifestyle. Okay. And that's became so pervasive so you, people can see. But it's the usual stuff. WhatsApp. I have four children, so you know they tend to use different channels. So WhatsApp and Instagram and Snap, they all make it to the home screen. I, I can't live without Spotify. I can't live without Google Maps. So those would be my four or five, mainly communication and, and music and navigation systems. What is one subject you'd like to learn more about? I'd like to understand much more about quantum computing because it's already on a horizon. And I think, I don't think enough people understand enough about it, but that would be the big change in technology that we've seen with AI. That's going to be the next thing we see a lot of. What activity helps spark creativity with you? Or what is it that helps you be creative? Location. I think like most people as to where I get in a creative space when I'm in certain places. I love to ski. When I'm on the top of the mountain and everything's good and the weather's nice and you just have your own thoughts in your own head and your headphones on and you listen to decent music, then I think those, so part of that. And then the second part would be when you're in a group of people and you're trying to solve a problem on the whiteboard and everybody's around the whiteboard just looking and say, how do we solve this? The, the creativity that you release, I think, at that, at that point in time, because you get that amplified effect with four or five different people thinking about the same problem. And what's the best piece of advice you've received that has really stuck with you? Yeah, nothing's ever as bad as it seems, nor is it ever as good as it seems. Uh, last question. If you had an extra hour of free time each day, how would you use it? Well, that's a good question. If it was an extra hour? Yes, extra. I'm going to be boring as hell. I'm going to say sleep. It's underrated. If I get an extra hour of sleep... Man, it makes such a difference. In, in our family, we say sleep is a weapon. Yeah. It can be used for you or against you. I agree with you 100%. Well, Jim, this has been a fantastic discussion and uh, so much to take away from what, what you talked about. But I think for our listeners, one of the things that struck me is we talk about products and evolution, that the design work is hand in glove with engineering. And that's how great products are born, that the consumer product design the stories you tell. It's not a straight line to create great products. And the best creations are the messier ones. It's not a straight line. And the messier the process, the better. Through failure, through robust debate or disagreement even, 
but it's about teams and collaboration is how great products are born. And the product companies, Apple or Volvo, have designed teams and product teams and manufacturing teams that hash out the messy to create the beautiful. And for you personally, having seen what you learned through your career in so many disciplines in so many ways, that this curiosity that you encourage in others is who leads in the best disciplines, what you've taken away from so many companies to be able to transform in, in places you've worked and, and led. And it's the technology. It's not just the design. Technology wins the day. And you talked a lot about technology, things I'd never heard of, the LIDAR, the laser technology to see in the dark, the ability that match the touch screen or the knob to know what technologies we'll use. But using technology not only to create a great product, but to help fix the pothole, uh, fix the, the crosswalk, geotag it and send it home. This concept of using technology for greater good as well as greater profit. I love the idea you said, hey, let us make a profitable car. Don't subsidize my car or, or my product. Subsidize the grid. Let government do its role and let the private sector do its role. And we'll create good deals like you, the deal you've just cut with Tesla to enable the charging stations. Let us do deals to be profitable. But most importantly for our listeners is the eight C's, commitment, collaboration, communication, compassion, continuous learning, courage, consistency, confidence develop the confidence for the first seven C's. And I would tell you, there's a lot there. You talk about hiring for energy and passion. Well, Jim, listening to your energy and passion has been fascinating for us. And we can't wait to see where Volvo goes from here. Jim, thank you for your energy, passion, commitment, and everything you're doing. It's really interesting to learn from. I appreciate that. Thanks for your kind words. And it was a pleasure to spend some time with you today. Fantastic. All the best. Thank you so much, Jim.